Let's see if I can put that. We can put that. Put that. Has controls. So, so we didn't like some mute, so that's also a thing. Okay. Some on computer. If it's going to ever open a Chrome. So you, you have a PowerPoint? It's already open. Up. Well, yeah, I'm gonna have to pass controls uh, for her to be able to do that. I think. Let's see if it'll allow. No, it'll allow. Can I? Are you familiar with Zoom? <laughs> well, I, I, you don't, I don't presume you want to start right off the go and show them the presentation. No, it's quite a few slides okay. here. Okay. So you would click this share screen down here and select PowerPoint and then click share. And then you're ready to stop sharing. So when you want to stop sharing, just hit stop share. No, I, you've already lost me. I don't even understand. <laughs> so, like, I, when I start my PowerPoint, what am I going to be looking at? <clears throat> Zoom or my PowerPoint? <clears throat> well, you're going to be seeing Zoom here. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be your PowerPoint, but it's going to be in Zoom. I mean, or you can sit in the chair with the thought of Yeah, I mean, it's just your PowerPoint on the screen. So they're seeing your screen, which is your PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you'd probably be looking at there. Or would be here? I guess since I'm on the Zoom thing, I can't. I mean, I'll be looking at, I guess I could look at both, but because yeah. I usually kind of walk around, but I just need to know. Yeah, I know. And but it's this is something new for all of us. So <laughs> this hasn't been figured this out, but stop sharing. So when am I going to start and stop sharing? Whenever you're ready to start presenting the PowerPoint to them. I mean, we can do it right now off the, right off the go. No, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, right now it's showing your webcam here and it's showing, it's showing us. Okay. So, that's what they're so saying. I'm, so, I'll speak, welcome everybody. And then, once I'm actually ready to start the PowerPoint, hit um, share screen. Mm -hmm. Do you want him to sit here off to the side and do that for you? I'm not ready? going to turn that down. Yeah. <laughs> I will not. We can just have some pull it here. No. I can just hang out at the here. bottom. Well, it, it would be less interrupted if you're just right off the side here. Just step right here. Because there's a video in there too that kind of freaks me out if it won't work. I, I don't. You just got to make. You just got to make sure, I, Alex. I, 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 it's, he it's figured out how to share it. Sam when you're yeah sharing it. Or what about it, optimized for video clip? That's yep. it, that really doesn't improve it a whole lot. But you just got to make sure to share, 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 share sound or the people on the other end will be able to hear the okay. sound from the video. Oh, that's easy to remember. Okay. Yeah, technology is just not me. It's, just not, me. <laughs> it's not my thing, and if it doesn't work well, I. Freak out, so. so I'm gonna pull this chair off. Yeah, the back. yeah. And if you need, need me, just like go point at me. I'm not. Yeah. What is your name? Alice. Alice. Okay. So great to have help. I'll stop that for two Whenever they tell me. Yes.
All right, we're going to go ahead and start for today. Our presentation uh, from this is our presenter today is from the Sexual Assault Center um, in Vidalia, in the Refuge. It's Heather Williams. She's going to be going over some information for you today on Sexual Assault Crisis Center um, and how you can connect with that and some of the things and why they do um, through their center what they do. So I'm going to let her give the presenter today. If you have any questions and you're remote, either through Zoom or through YouTube Live, if you will send those questions over, uh, Ms. Cynthia Reese with our Student Conduct Office is monitoring the chat, her and Mr. Joe Kennedy with IT, so they'll get those questions over to our presenter. So if you're out remote and you want to ask questions, feel free to send those over as well for any of our audience members, and I will turn it over to Ms. Williams now. Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. This is a, a very different platform for me. I have This is the first time I've done a presentation where I have people in front of me and then I have a computer camera in front of me. So this is a little different for me. So we'll figure it out together. But thank you so much to East Georgia for allowing me to come and speak this morning. Um, to me, this is a very important topic um, and I like to share information about it so that to others, it becomes a very important topic as well. Uh, my name is Heather Williams and I am from the Refuge Sexual Assault Center in Vidalia. Um, we are part of a dual program, which means we have two things we do, which is domestic violence, a domestic violence shelter, as well as a sexual assault center. So we, we were established um, originally as a domestic violence shelter. Um, and then a few years ago, um, we, in 2012, um, had a sexual assault program. However, due to funding restraints, um, it was not able to really serve the community the way that we hope to be able to. Um, and then just a few years ago, um, 2017, 2018, um, CJCC, which is the, um, it's a council in, in Atlanta that basically oversees domestic violence and sexual assault centers in Georgia. They did a study and they decided that in our area, which is a five county service area from Vidalia, I'll go over our counties in a little bit. They decided that they were seeing too many sexual assault victims um, having to get services elsewhere. So they presented it to the refuge uh, shelter and said, would you be interested in helping us um, to establish a sexual assault center? Understanding it at this time today, we only have for 159 counties in the state of Georgia, we only have 28 certified sexual assault centers. So that's not very many centers to serve our, our victims. Um, and one thing we want to do is make sure that they don't have to go very far to obtain the services that they deserve uh, when they need them. So the refuge said, yes, we would um, definitely be on board. We um, enlisted the assistance from the Haven, which is a dual center from Valdosta. They helped us get set up, trained. We have our building and they, they released us and let us go. And that's how, kind of how we got to where we are today. So I'm going to be sharing some information today about, about the center, um, about the services that we provide, about why we even need these services, um, understanding that this is a, a probably a bigger problem than you may realize. And um, we're going to go over that and kind of talk about how to, how to reach us. Um, if you or somebody that you know um, needs our services, um, how, to, how to reach out to us. And I, I know that there are students um, from other areas that are going to be seeing this, including students from maybe the Augusta area, um, maybe the Statesboro area. And I'm going to go over the resources that are available to you in those areas as well. So I will figure this out to screen share. All right, I think we're good. All right, before we get too far into this, I want to let you know that this is a very sensitive topic. It's very likely that you know somebody who has uh, been a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, it's very possible you have witnessed domestic violence or sexual assault or that you yourself have been a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. So understanding that that's what we're talking about today, um, it's a very sensitive topic, um, and it may, just talking about it or hearing about it may bring up some feelings or emotions, some thoughts, some memories that um, may surprise you. If you find yourself in this situation, 
please feel free to get up and leave at any time if you need to step out. Um, if you're watching via Zoom um, or social media, please understand too that you may need to click out of this presentation if um, you start to feel certain emotions that maybe you're not quite ready to handle um, at that time and then come back and revisit. You're also always welcome to reach out to us and we'll talk about that, how we can get you some help later. So what do we do? I briefly touched on how we got established. Um, it's important to understand that we are not just um, a, a one service type of organization. We do multiple things through the refuge, including emergency shelter. Um, so that means housing women and children who are currently victims of domestic violence, um, who need a safe place to stay. Um, we do offer our services to men as well. However, we are not able to put them into the shelter, but we would help them establish a safe shelter in a hotel for three to five days and work with them on a safe place to go after that. We have an outreach program, so everything we do is not just kept within the confines of our buildings. We do have outreach. In this area, we have an outreach program for Emanuel County all by itself specifically. Um, Dawn Scarborough is our outreach advocate, and she has an office here in Emanuel County, um, so that services are very readily available to this area, and then if she needs to communicate uh, with the shelter in Vidalia, she can do so. Child advocacy, so we do have children at our shelter and we do understand that these children need help sometimes processing through things that have um, occurred to them directly or that they have witnessed or been a part of. So we, we love working with our children. Legal advocacy programs, we understand that sometimes um, our victims need some legal assistance. Although we are not lawyers and we are not law enforcement officers, we do advocate for our victims with our legal and law enforcement agencies. And one of the things that we do with that is called a TPO. That's a temporary protection order. Sometimes you hear uh, of that referred to as a restraint order. So it's an order, it is a legal document that we can help our victims get established in order to set some parameters so that um, a victim's assailant is not able to have access to them by law. Case management, so we understand that there are multiple things that our victims um, may need assistance with. So when they're in the shelter, they may need, might need assistance with finding a safe place to live. Maybe they need uh, help finding a job. Maybe they need help getting a vehicle. Um, understand very often our victims come to the shelter um, literally with the clothes on their back. They may have their children with them, but everything else they may have left at home in order to escape an unsafe environment. Even things like a cell phone, sometimes those are taken from them. Uh, car keys are often taken from them and they don't have access to them. So we help get those up and running, help them get back established and on their feet again. And that's what our case managers do. They kind of serve that broad spectrum need of our victims and their families. Follow up, we don't just help them out of an immediate crisis and then leave the picture. So we're there for the duration. So if they need any follow up care, be it legal, law enforcement, um, medical care, we're there to help them through that. And then the rape crisis program. So that is my heart as the as a coordinator of the rape crisis center. Um, we are separate location from the shelter. So the shelter for pretty obvious reasons. We like to keep the location of that kind of under wraps so that um, certain people who don't need to know where it is aren't, aren't familiar with our location there um, for the safety integrity of our women and children that are staying there. However, the Rape Crisis Center, we do want people to know where we are. Uh, we're on Jackson Street in Vidalia, right across the street from the library. Um, we do want people to know where we are because oftentimes um, we have people come and see us. Um, we have had victims come and knock on the door and say, I think I need to talk to somebody instead of going through law enforcement or going through a hospital or medical personnel. So we encourage people to know where we are and come see our center. Prevention education program. So that's pretty much what we're doing today. We're educating the community, um, students, staff, and faculty here at East Georgia State College to know who we are and what we do. Um, and then further so that you have that knowledge because you might personally never need our services. And I pray that that is the case. However, you might know somebody 
who finds himself in a very dangerous situation and they might need our services. And you might be the one who has the knowledge of who we are and how to get to us and you can pass that on to your friend. And then volunteer program. With COVID right now, we've kind of had to put the pause button on our volunteer program, but when things kind of get a little more safe in the living environment we have right now, we do have volunteers that we encourage to come and work with us in our outreach um, for our, our activities within the community. When we participate in community activities, we do enjoy people coming and working with us. So goals and purpose, kind of what do we do, why we do it? Providing emergency shelter and services for uh, victims of family violence and for sexual assaults. We get the victim to protect uh, a protected new beginning and supportive follow-up. Like I said, we don't, it's not, once, once we're done and out of the picture, we're not really out of the picture. We're always there doing outreach with our victims. And we have a 24 hour crisis line. So this is not a Monday through Friday, nine to five operation. This is around the clock. Um, we understand that things like this can happen literally around the clock, so we're available around the clock. Um, that number right there, the 538-9935, that is our crisis number. Um, and I encourage you to kind of tuck it away somewhere, write it down, put it in your phone. I do have brochures with me here today for the, the people that are here to please take. This phone number rings to the domestic violence shelter. And from there, the advocate that answers the phone will kind of get some information from you about what kind of situation you find yourself in. Is this a domestic violence situation? Is it a sexual assault situation? Sometimes it's both. Um, and then connect you with the correct advocate to help you at that moment. So let's understand a little bit more about sexual violence. Um, according to the, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, sexual violence is any sexual act, attempt to obtain a sexual act or other act directed against a person's sexuality using coercion by any person, regardless of their relationship to the victim in any setting. And this includes rape. So this is basically all about consent. Rape is a form of violence in which sex is used as a weapon. It occurs when a person engages in sexual intercourse by forcible compulsion or with someone who is incapable of consent. Threatening someone in order to force them to consent to having sex is not consent and is considered rape. And I will tell you that, um, you know, this talks about someone who's incapable of consent. That means if you're drunk or you've been taking some drugs, and someone takes advantage of you and has sex with you, you didn't give consent. Just because you may not physically be able to fight back doesn't mean that you gave consent. So that is considered um, a rape. So a lot of people don't understand. They're like, well, I don't know anybody who's ever been raped. I've never seen it. I, I've never had anybody try to take advantage of me personally. Um, so we need to kind of understand why this is important, why this is a thing in our area. Um, the Domestic Violence Shelter and the Sexual Assault Center offer services to a five county service areas, and that includes Emanuel County, Toombs County, Trutland County, Wheeler, and Montgomery County. Since the Sexual Assault Center got up and running, um, we have added an additional two counties, and that is Candler and Tattnall counties to our service area. Now, what that means by saying it's our service area means that we are kind of in charge of making sure that those counties know who we are, what we do. We educate the law enforcement officers and the medical personnel in those counties as to our services, how to contact us, and how we work with them for the best of the victim. Um, now, I, like I said, I do know that there are other counties um, who are going to be represented. And I do have that contact information coming up. Um, but to be quite honest, to me, if you have questions or need to reach out um, about domestic violence or sexual assault, to me, it doesn't matter what county you're from. If you need assistance and you have our phone number, you can call us. Um, if it's not a county that we would actually become directly involved with, we would contact the resource in the county that you would need to seek services with and we would hook you up with the right one. So we're never just going to say, no, that's a different county. Here's their phone number. Have a good day. 
we're going to stick with you. We're going to hook you up to the resource that you need to make sure that you get the services that, that you're, you're needing. So these are some pretty staggering statistics. In the United States, a woman is raped every six minutes. One out of every six American women has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. So just by looking at the people here, I know this has touched somebody's life in some capacity, just by our, the stats that we have. About 3% of American men or one in 33 have experienced an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. This is not a female only assault. Sexual violence happens with every gender, every identity. Some genders and identities are at higher risk than others. Um, the, 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 uh, our Rape Crisis Center offers our services to males and females. Uh, we have had victims who are male, who are the victims of a sexual assault. And we offer our service to them um, just as much as we would a, a, a female. And 84% of all rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. This is, this is a shocking one to some people. The thought that rapes and sexual violence happen when you're walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night and someone comes up from behind you and you don't see their face or it's some masked stranger, that, that's a myth. That's TV. That's sensationalized by the TV shows that we watch. The vast majority of sexual assaults and rapes are committed not by somebody who's a stranger, but by somebody that the victim knows. And very often um, it's either a family member, um, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, husband. It, it is true that you um, can be considered raped by your husband. Years ago, that wasn't a thing. If a female was taken advantage of and was raped by her husband, it was considered part of the marriage relationship, but that is against the law. So yes, women can be raped by their husbands. It doesn't matter what the relationship is. Rape is rape no matter what your relationship with the offender is. So these statistics are a little bit more focused to the college age student. Women ages 18 to 24 are at an elevated risk of sexual violence. Approximately one in four female undergraduates and nearly one in 14 male undergraduates report experiencing sexual violence since enrolling in their college or university. This is all colleges and universities. This isn't just the large state four-year colleges and universities. This is across the board. So this would include schools like here. It includes technical colleges as well. More than 50% of college sexual assaults occur in either August, September, October, and November. There are a lot of things going on when the summer's over and people come back to school or go away to school for the first time, especially the freshman or the sophomore who has never been on their own, suddenly finds themselves in a situation where they're living in a dorm or they're living in an apartment, they're on their own. They finally have the freedom from their parents that they've been longing for for such a long time and they, they can get involved in activities that are considered more at risk. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is never, ever an excuse or an understandable reason for a rape. Just because she's wearing a really tight tank top does not give someone the right to rape her or commit some act of sexual violence. Just because she's wearing um, you know, something that's really low cut or super short shorts, none of your clothing is not your consent. And it should never be taken advantage of just because she chooses to wear something. Just because she chooses to go to a party and have a few drinks 
and her inhibitions drop a little bit, that's not an excuse to commit an act of sexual assault or rape on a female. And I keep saying she, because statistically speaking, that's very often the gender that we're talking about, but none of that matters. There is no excuse and rape isn't about sex. Rape isn't because he hasn't had it in a while and she's just really pretty. So he decided he wanted to get with her that night. That's not what it is. Sexual assault and rape, just like domestic violence, is an act of power and control. It has nothing to do with the actual act of sex. It has to do all with power and control and exerting that power and control over somebody else. So August, September, October, November, summer's over, leaving the parents on your own, no rules, no curfew, you go where you want, you do what you want, you're back with your friends, and you're ready to have a good time. That's why these months are typically the highest in terms of reporting um, sexual assaults and rapes um, that we see, especially on college campuses. So students are at increased risk during the first few months of their first and second semesters in college. Same reason. I'm on my own. I can do what I want. Mom and dad aren't telling me when I have to be home. This is great. Making new friends, maybe not the right friends, maybe not the right environment, but it's great. And so you're going to go out and do what you want. And before you know it, you find yourself in the wrong time the wrong place, the wrong situation. And that's why we see these students um, who haven't quite got into the swing of college, haven't quite gotten into the study time and going to classes and their focus is in the wrong place. And so that's why we tend to see the first and second semesters of our freshmen typically be our highest risk times. Every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted, and every nine victims, every nine seconds, um, or minutes, excuse me, that victim is a child. Every nine minutes, it's a child. That's a horrible number. All of these numbers are horrible. We shouldn't have numbers like this. However, only five out of every thousand rapists will end up in prison. That's it. Five out of a thousand will end up in prison. And those are the ones that actually go through the court process. Each year, it's estimated that 25,000 American women will become pregnant following an act of sexual violence. As many as 22,000 of those pregnancies could have been prevented through the prompt use of emergency contraceptive, which is something that we offer at the Refuge Sexual Assault Center, depending on the time frame that the assault happened that is a medication that we offer and all of our services are free. Nobody ever pays anything for any of our services. In Georgia in 2017, there were 2,684 reported rapes and 349 arrests. That's it, 349 arrests. There are a lot of reasons that go into why these numbers are so low. Maybe there aren't resources available to the victims in that area. Maybe there is no rape crisis center for them to get assistance. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they've been threatened. Maybe they're afraid nobody's going to believe them. Maybe this is a pattern of behavior that they have been exposed to since they were a child. And then once they go off to college and it happens there, we don't need to report it. It's been happening to me all my life. It's just, just another day, another person. And we see that. Unfortunately, we see that. Only 16% of rapes are ever reported to police. In a survey of victims who do not report or an attempted a, a rape or an attempted rape to the police, these are the reasons that we're hearing why they might not have. 43% thought nothing could be done. 27% felt like it was a private matter. 12% were afraid of the police response and 2% felt like it was not important enough. And we wanna dispel every single one of these reasons. 
43% thinking that nothing can be done. It's a very helpless feeling to be a victim of sexual assault or rape. It's very helpless because I told you it's all about control. And in that moment, every bit of control was taken away from you. Every bit. You have no control over anything. And it's very hard to get that control back by yourself. But that's one of the reasons why we're here so that we can offer the assistance, so we can offer the support. We have a team that takes care of our victims. They are never alone. If they want to pro press charges and go through the court process, we're there with them. We've recently had a case that went to court. There were, there were four of us who supported that victim in the courtroom, sitting literally beside her through the entire process. She was never alone. So there are things that can be done and there's a team that gets together and helps those things to be done. I was 22 when I was raped. I was 19. I was 20. I didn't report it for, you know, a thousand reasons, a million reasons. It was somebody I was involved with. It was a friend of a friend. My drug dealer. Met this photographer by myself. I got very drunk. I met some guy in this bar. He started trying to kiss me and and I said, no. He takes my left leg and raises it on his shoulder. He went to put his hand in my panties and I tried to kind of deflect his hand and that's when he slapped my hand away. I blacked out. I was fighting like pretty hard at this point, just saying, no, please don't, please don't. I came to, internally I was shaking. I was really trying to look as calm as possible. And I could uh, tell that something that I hadn't wanted to happen, happened. He just, he held me down and he, he forced himself inside me. And I was being pleasant and nice just so I could remain safe and get out of there. And I kind of just ran out into the street with like my pants on inside out and my shoes off. And he um, sat up and he looked at me and that was, I guess, the scariest moment for me because I could tell he was deciding whether he was actually going to stop or not, and that was the moment that I realized that I had thought I was in control of a situation that I was not in control of at all. And I blame myself for putting myself in that situation. I knew that I had no proof. I could hear people's judgment saying, well, why did you do that? It was your fault. I was still in like physical pain from this and sitting there going, oh, well, no one's going to believe me. It was my word against his. Everyone was just going to go, this girl just, you know. Um, okay. Um, not sure what happened there. Let me see if I can. I was, well, he was deciding was not in control of it all. And I blame myself for putting myself in that situation. I knew that I had no proof. I could hear people's judgment saying, well, why did you do that? It was your fault. I was still in like physical pain from this and sitting there going, oh, well, no one's gonna believe me. It was my word against his. Everyone was just gonna go, this girl just, you know, slept with this guy and changed her mind. I wasn't the perfect victim. I figured who's gonna believe some cokehead college girl. I didn't like try to fight him off or I didn't slap him around or, you know, I didn't pick up the phone and call 911. I didn't know that I was important enough to, um, to draw boundaries around what people could and couldn't do with my body. Who wants to come forward with the literal most violating thing that can happen to you, relive it, and then have people telling you that you're making it up. And I thought I would just be better off trying to put this behind me. I couldn't imagine pressing charges and then having to sit in a courtroom and look at his face over and over. I thought, well, you know, that's like giving him what he wants. Like I'm spending more time on him or spending more energy on this. I imagine, and I think rightfully so, that it would have been more traumatizing for me in many ways had I reported it. It's 
up to a survivor to decide what they do with their story. It's up to them if they want to report it or not. I don't want this to be a part of who I am. I hated myself a lot at the time. We are violated, we are harassed, we are touched, we are trapped, we're scared. And we just take a chip on the shoulder and we keep our lives going and that's not fair to us. And I think it would be wrong to tell them that they don't get to decide what happens. Okay. Okay. Didn't quite play through the last one, but she had just almost done. So we'll go on. Um, everything that they are talking about now, these women, those women in that video, they did not report to law enforcement. Obviously, they're sharing their story. But when we say they didn't report, it means they didn't report it to law enforcement. And you heard their reasons. And inside of what they were saying, we heard these reasons. We heard shame. What should she expect when she dresses like that? She shouldn't have had too much to drink. One girl said, well, she's just a cokehead. We have denial or minimization. It wasn't that big of a deal. Fear of consequences. Sexual harassers frequently threaten the lives, jobs, and careers of the victims, and many victims are frightened by the offender's position of power and what he could do with it. What if he's a law enforcement officer? What if he's a pastor? What if he's in administration? What if he's a boss, an employer? So we have to consider all those things and how fearful these victims are of subsequent consequences of just reliving the situation or having other consequences come up from the original assault. And many times they just want to forget about it. They just want it to go away. They just want to move on. But if it's not dealt with, it will never go away. It keeps coming up. It has to be dealt with for their emotional and mental sake for the rest of their lives. And that's why we're here so that we can help them with that. We also hear about low self-esteem. Sexual violations wound a woman's self-esteem, self-concept, her sense of self. The more a girl or woman puts up with, the more her self-image becomes distorted. Again, thinking about that person who has been a victim, maybe since they were a child, maybe this is something that they saw or heard or experienced in their home. That's what they grew up with. Why should they experience or expect anything different as they become an adult? Their self-esteem was never built up for them to appreciate and understand how special they are, how unique they are, how that nobody deserves to be treated that way, no matter what's going on. But if that's the lifestyle they were brought up in, oftentimes that self-esteem is so damaged that they never get to that point. Feeling of hopelessness or helplessness. They feel it's hopeless because they are, won't be believed. Reputations might be tainted and possibly ruined disbelief or disassociated or drugged, unclear memory or unsure of what happened. There are many reasons why a victim might not remember what happened. There are many reasons why I've had victims come and sit in front of me and say, I don't know what happened, but I know something isn't right. I'm in pain or I'm bleeding or I had one beer last night and normally I can drink a whole lot more than that. And I don't remember anything that something happened to me. I just know it. But because they can't remember, they feel like they won't be believed. But there are reasons why they don't remember. Alcohol, drugs, that could be the reason why they don't remember. The trauma itself could be why they don't remember. You remove that memory, your brain, in an attempt to protect you. During that trauma, a different part of your brain takes over. And while they might remember very vivid moments leading up to the assault, they might remember 
the pattern of flowers on the wall, the color of paint on the wall, what the carpet looked like, what the cologne smelled like. They might remember all of these things, but when it gets down to the memory of the action, it's gone. But there are true physiological reasons why that happens. And she doesn't have to just assume no one will believe her because she can't remember, because we can explain why she can't remember. And when we talk about disassociation, so have you heard of fight or flight? There's a third F, it's called freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. Oftentimes my victims freeze. They fight at first, they'll put up a fight, they'll say no. But if their aggressor is persistent, says threatening words, words of further harm, threatens physical harm worse than what they're experiencing at that moment, if they could become more violent, hitting, slapping, punching, they freeze. Because the fear and worry that further injury will happen if they continue to fight, oftentimes they freeze and they give in and they literally lay there and they let him finish knowing that that's the safest thing for them to do. It's called self-preservation. And they lay there and they cry until it's over because they know that by giving in and letting him do what he wants to do and just get it over with is a lot better than some of the fear of the injury that could happen if they continue to fight. There's a reason why they do that. Their brain and their body is protecting them it's not giving in. It's not quitting. It's not, why didn't I fight? It's self-preservation. I have to stay alive. So we kind of talked about this, about alcohol, about drugs. They're often used in sexual assault. Alcohol is the most commonly used substance and it's called a drug facilitated sexual assault. It's when the aggressor uses some form of alcohol or drug in order to make their victim a little more agreeable, a little less fight. They become a little more relaxed, agreeing to things that normally with a clear head, they might not agree to. Often in the college age student, we do see alcohol being used, but then you start mixing other drugs. Prescription drugs like sleep aids, anxiety meds, muscle relaxers, tranquilizers can also be used. Oftentimes, if this is something that maybe their victim takes on a regular basis, it's a normal prescribed medication for them, but then they're given maybe more alcohol than they think they're taking in. Those don't mix. That's not safe to mix the alcohol with some of these medications. And so it actually might be maybe unintentional but then they find themselves in a position where they don't have the strength or the presence of mind to be able to fight the way that they might want to. Street drugs like GHB, you've heard of roofies maybe, ecstasy, something called ketamine. There are drugs that change the color, that don't, excuse me, do not change the color, the odor or the taste of an alcoholic drink. And I actually, I'm, I'm, I debated on whether or not I was gonna talk about this next slide because I don't wanna give anybody ideas, to be honest. I don't wanna tell you what to use to incapacitate your victim because you're gonna be shocked with what it is. But at the same time, even more than not wanting to give you an idea of what to use. I want to let you know so that you are armed and knowledgeable on how to protect yourself from something that is so common. You never think that it would be used as a drug in sexual assaults. So not just Visine, any red eye eye drop. The leading chemical in these eye drops, 
when mixed with alcohol, will make somebody have a lowered body temperature, they'll have breathing difficulty, eventually with too much respiratory failure as possible, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, their blood pressure goes up and down, they start shaking, seizures, coma. There are stories that you can find, I have found two really fast, just by a really quick Google search, about two cases, oddly enough, both were in South Carolina, a man killed his wife, a woman killed her husband, both by poisoning with red eye eye drops. If you use too much, you kill them. But if you don't use that much, you render them very flaccid, very pliable. Their muscles get really weak and limp. It's like being drunk times 10. And the kicker with this, is it erases memory? Now, I'm not telling you so that you can be armed with what to, to use for a sexual assault. I'm telling you so that you know that it doesn't have to be something super fancy, some designer drug that was dropped in your drink. It can be something that costs, what, less than $4, $3 that you can buy at any drugstore. You've heard time and time again, don't leave your drink unattended. Don't let somebody else make a drink for you. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. You never know what someone could put in it. And who's going to question somebody going out to a club or to a bar and having something like Visine in their pocket? Pay attention. I'm not saying don't live your life, don't have a good time, don't do what you want to do, but be aware. Look around, watch your drink. So our center is very peaceful. The colors were picked very intentionally to be very calming for our victims. We have big comfy couches, big fluffy pillows. We'll get you something some water, we'll get you a snack. Because while you're there, you are the only person in our world that we are concerned about at that time. It's not like going to an emergency room and a nurse has got four patients and she's in and out or he or she is in and out and taking care of a bunch of people. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You've got support and you've got medical care. 24 hour crisis line. So let's talk a little bit about the people, the people that take care of you. So the first person as a victim, the first person that our victim talks to, they're called an advocate. And they are specially trained on how to calm somebody down, reassure them, let them know you're in a safe place. We are here to take care of you. That advocate's going to talk to that person about what services we provide, how we provide them. We're going to sign consent forms. We can't do anything without a person's giving us the yes. Isn't it all about power and control? And we give the power and control back to our victims. From the minute they walk in the door, they are in control. If they don't want to do something, we don't do it. If they don't want an exam, we don't do an exam. If they don't want pictures taken, we don't take pictures. They are in control. If they don't want us to talk to law enforcement, we don't talk to law enforcement. So a SANE, S-A-N-E, stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner. So in the state of Georgia, you have to be an RN to be a SANE. These are specially trained nurses on how to care for a victim of sexual assault. We know how to take care of them. We know how to assess them. We know how to collect evidence properly, legally, how to finish that rape kit, how to give it to the law enforcement officer so that they can have the DNA possibly that we found during that exam so they can send it off to the GBI crime lab. They can run it, they can get results back. That's what we do. Above everything else, we are nurses and we are there to make sure that our patient is safe, not harmed, 
any injuries that they could have um, sustained are taken care of. If they need to go to the emergency room and haven't been yet, we will get them to the emergency room. That trumps our exam. We'll take them to the ER. We'll get them the care that they need, and then we'll bring them back and we'll continue. But their health and safety and well being is critical and most important to that same. And then during the exam, with all the consent signed, we talk to them. We just sit down. We sit down on, in, on big couches and we just talk. And we ask them, tell me, tell me what happened last night. What do you remember? And you can start at the end. You can start at the beginning. You can tell me, th throw in something that happened two days ago. That's fine too. I can keep up with you because we understand that our victims' memories are fragmented. It doesn't have to all make sense, but we can follow. We'll take notes. And that helps us to know what part of the body do we need to look at? Where might there be injuries? Because that, that discussion is going to guide what happens in the next room. And in that next room is where we do our physical exam. Where we're going to look. If my victim tells me that her aggressor grabbed her by the wrist and held her arms down to her side, then I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to take swabs of that wrist because he touched it. You don't ever commit an act of aggression and not leave something behind and take something with you. So they always leave something behind. An aggressor may think they're slab, but they leave something behind. And it's our job as, as forensic nurses to kind of piece it together and see if we can't find what they left behind. If he touched her wrist, I swab the wrist and see if we can't get touch DNA there. It's not just all about the act of this sexual assault. It's the whole body. Where was she touched? What did he do? What did he say? Did he push you down? If he pushed you down, did you hit your head on the floor? Because so I need to look at your head. I need to see if you have a bruise. I need to see if there's anything there that we need to take pictures of. It's all about guiding that physical exam. We take pictures of everything that could possibly be considered an injury. We photo document everything. It's not uncommon for me to take anywhere from 150 to 180 plus photos during our exams. And we might not need them all, but we're gonna take them all. We're gonna get them. We're gonna take that, those pictures because they could be used for evidence. We have therapy services for both our domestic violence and our sexual assault victims. You know, sometimes people aren't ready to talk when something like this happens. DV or SA. DV is domestic violence, SA is sexual assault. Maybe they're not ready to talk. Maybe it happened 10 years ago and they weren't ready to talk, but something happened a couple of days ago and it's brought it all back. And now they can't stop thinking about it and they need to talk to someone. That's why we're here. Our services aren't all or none. If, uh, if a victim only needs counseling, let's talk. Let's see what we can do about getting you connected with our counselor. Let's get you to talk to somebody. It doesn't cost you anything. Maybe that's why they never got counseling or therapy in the past because they couldn't afford it. Well, we don't charge anything. So let us get them some, some assistance. Let us get them some counseling or some therapy. Community education. I already told you that's what we're doing today. I'm telling you who we are, what we do, how we work once you get to the center, what you can expect from us, what you should expect from us, what our, what our purpose is. I'm empowering you with knowledge about our services, about this is a problem, whether you've seen it in your life yet or not. This is a problem. And just because you haven't encountered it yet doesn't mean that you won't. It doesn't mean that your best friend won't encounter it. And your best friend might not hear this presentation, but you are. So 
what happens when your best friend tells you that at the party last week that something happened. She thinks somebody raped her as a friend. What are you going to do? Support, of course. Listen, of course. Believe. Above all, believe what they tell you. And then get them our information and get us connected with them. One of the things as nurses, you know, one, one of the reasons why people say that they don't, they didn't want to report is because they didn't think anyone would believe them, right? We went over that. Well, I'm trained as a nurse. I've been a nurse since 1996. And one of the first things I'm taught as a nurse and every other nurse is ever taught is that you believe your patient. My patient is a victim if, of a, a violent act. Yes, they are considered a victim, but to me as a nurse, they are my patient. If my patient tells me they're in pain and I ask them to rate it and they say it's an eight, it's really, really bad. I'm like, well, you're sitting here watching TV eating some popcorn. If I was at an eight, I'd probably be begging for some pain medicine. Can I at least have a Tylenol or something to take the edge off? That's how I might be acting, but it doesn't matter how I might act. If my patient says they're in pain and their level's an eight, we need to act appropriately. If my patient tells me that she was raped, she was raped. I am not law enforcement. It is not my job to decide whether or not she was. It is not my job to decide whether or not she's telling me the truth because to me, she is. And I believe her. And I collect the evidence. And then I let law enforcement do their job. Their job is to investigate, not mine. So yes, believe your friend and get them to us. Let us help them. So I talked to you a little bit about some other centers that are available to you if you live um, in another area. Now, when we talk about this, the area that we take care of or that we are, um, that we take, we are assigned to, you know, I said, I gave you our list of seven counties at the sexual assault center that we work with. What that means is, did the assault happen in one of those counties? It goes by where the assault happened, not where the victim lives. So for example, um, if, if there's a student here who lives in Atlanta, and they, um, they went home for the weekend and they were sexually assaulted. They didn't report it. They came back here and they report it. We can still be called. We can still do the kit, but it'll actually be um, investigated in Atlanta, but it would be, it would not be very victim centered to send them to Atlanta to have a rape kit done. So we really take into consideration what is the situation, what happened in that assault. But in the area of uh, Brian Bullock, Effingham, Evans, Jenkins, Long, and Scrabbing counties, you have the Teal House, the Statesboro Regional Sexual Assault and Child Advocacy Center. That's one place that kind of go by both names. And that's their crisis line number 24-7. Burke, Columbia, Jefferson, McDuffie, Richmond, Washington counties, they use the University Health Services, Inc., Rape Crisis and Sexual Assault Services. And here is their their uh, crisis number, their 24 seven crisis number. So I'll leave that for just a minute. But if anybody were to ever need our services or talk, even if you don't want to go forward, let me, let me take this opportunity to talk about moving forward. So oftentimes a victim doesn't even know what happened. They haven't processed it. They, they might remember but it doesn't make sense that it might feel like it was a dream. Did it really happen? Maybe they're questioning themselves. Depending on who did it, maybe they're afraid to report them. But let me tell you some of the things that we do at our center. Yes, we do a rape kit. Yes, we're gonna offer support and help. We're gonna collect evidence, all, all with consent, as long as they consent to it. Yes, we're gonna take photos as long as they consent to it. But we don't have to call the police. As long as my victim is over 17 years old, I don't have to, by law, call the police. They're considered an adult. They can report or not. 
Getting the police involved is up to them. So if they need help, if they need medical help, if they want medication, in my center, we offer medication. We treat as if my victim has been exposed to sexually transmitted infections. We don't test for them. We can refer them to their physician or to the health department um, if they want testing. But we have medications in-house ready to go. And that includes, you've heard of the morning after pill or plan B. It includes that. We offer that as long as we see them within the time frame to administer that. Maybe they're just, they just come because they want those medicines and that's okay too. They're still exposed to us. We can still talk. We can still let them know what we can do for them. But do we have to call the police? No, we don't. They can be anonymous. Here's the cool thing about being an anonymous report, a Jane Doe or a John Doe. So we only have 120 hours or five days to be able to collect evidence. So when I say evidence, I mean DNA, swabbing the, the parts of the body that, that the assailant either licked or touched or bit or in the vaginal area, if there was a rape, we can swab for DNA that way, inside and or outside the body. So when I say collecting evidence, we have five days. That's what I'm talking about. Other than that, showers happen. Um, it, it, you know, just, it's gone after about five days. So it's critical that we get the victim in front of us and we do the collection of the evidence as quickly as possible before it's gone. Now, just because I have a rape kit that has swabs in it, that's sealed up and ready to go, that does not mean it gets sent to the crime lab. It means once my victim leaves the center and is done, everything that they have signed is signed Jane Doe or John Doe. Then my advocate's gonna call the police department and say, hey, I have a rape kit, I need a case number. It's a Jane or a John Doe kit. They give us a case number. We put that as a reference on everything. They collect the kit from us. They have to hold it by law for 12 months. It does not get sent to the crime lab because the crime lab won't take it unless it has a name on it, a true name, not a Jane or a John Doe. So they have to hold it for 12 months. And in those 12 months, my advocate is going to contact them and say, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? Can I answer any questions? And then if they change their mind and they say, you know what? I'm ready to go. I, I, want, I, I want my kit tested. I want my name on it. Great. Come back in, sign your consents again with your name on it. My advocate calls law enforcement and says, hey, that case number reference, whatever, that one's ready to go. She wants to change. She wants to be a report. Because in the moment, in those first five days, they might not be ready to make that decision. But at least we have it. Because if you wait two weeks or three weeks or four weeks after it happened and you finally say, okay, I want to have a rape kit. I don't remember. Something happened to me. I want to know if someone had sex with me. I want to know if someone's DNA was inside of my body. It's too late. It's gone. We can't tell you. We won't do an exam, a physical exam. Now, we'll still offer all of our other services, but weeks out, there's nothing left physically for us to collect. So let us collect it. Come let us get it while it's there. You don't have to have it processed. You don't have to press charges. You don't have to call law enforcement. You don't have to have an investigator come and sit down and have a conversation with you and write a report. It gives you 12 months to change your mind. So that's one of the great things that we can offer. So there's no pressure. There is a time limit, but there's no pressure to get law enforcement involved. So what can you do if you know this has happened to you or someone you know? Report it. Even if you don't, I don't wanna get him in trouble. Okay, then don't tell anybody who did it, but at least tell somebody that you need assistance. 
that you need to see a sane, that you need someone to call the refuge for you. At least do that. You can call us directly. I'll make sure you have my number. And call the crisis line 24 seven. Even if you have questions, you don't want to report, but you have questions. You want to ask something, you need clarification. If it's domestic violence, call us. If it's safe for you to call, call us. We understand the process of leaving a domestic violence situation. Domestic violence relationships basically means anything where there is a true relationship there. Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, ex-husband, ex-wife. Let us help you make a, a safety plan. Statistically, we know that when a victim of domestic violence leaves their offender, that is the most dangerous time for that victim. Because again, power and control. If her abuser knows she's leaving, all power and control is gone. He's lost it. And she's starting to take it back and they get really mad. That is the most dangerous time for a domestic violence victim is when they decide to leave. So it might not be safe. You know, we're often asked, well, why did she stay? If it was so bad, why did she stay? Because maybe she's trying to stay alive. Maybe she's trying to help her kids stay alive. Maybe he's threatened that he'll kill the children or her family. Maybe he's threatened that he'll have his friends come gang rape her. He'll find her. Maybe he's threatened her that he's going to chop her up into little pieces and bury her in the woods behind their house. And nobody will ever find them. These are things that we've heard. Would you leave if somebody told you they were going to do that to you and you believed them because of years of abuse, you've learned to believe that what they say they'll do, you wouldn't leave, you'd stay. Statistically, we know that it takes an average of seven to nine times that a victim leaves their abuser before they leave for good, or it gets to the point where they're dead and they can't leave. An average of seven to nine times before they leave for good, because it's the power and control that that person has over them and they love them. Above all, they love them. They love the person they once were. And oftentimes we hear, well, I loved him and I wanted to help him because he didn't always used to be that way. He's still there inside. Somewhere he's still there inside. And I wanted to help him find him again. We hear these things. So if you know somebody or you're in domestic violence, I get it. I know. I know leaving is the most dangerous time, but we're here to help you make a plan. It may not be wise for you to run out tomorrow night. Let us help you come up with a plan somehow to get to us. I will stop screen sharing. Don't really know how. Oh. So one thing that I did not include on this, but I would like to touch on this for just a minute um, is strangulation. Told you we were going to talk about some heavy things today. Strangulation is actually something that we are seeing a lot of in both domestic violence and our sexual assault cases. So when somebody puts something on or around your neck, that is not choking. A lot of our victims will tell us or tell law enforcement, he choked me. He choked me out. Choking is when you take a bite of your hamburger and it's too big and you didn't chew it up well enough and you swallow and it gets stuck and you start coughing and hacking. Or when a toddler is eating something like a hot dog a little too aggressively and they don't chew it up and it gets stuck. That's choking, that's airway, that's choking. Strangulation is circulation. It's stopping or impeding the ability for blood to flow, oxygen rich blood to flow to your brain. And then for that blood after it's dropped off the oxygen in your brain to flow back out of your brain, that's strangulation. 
And you can use anything to strangle somebody. It doesn't have to be their hands. Any body part can strangle somebody. Phone cords, ligatures, ties, scarves, pieces of jewelry. And we're seeing it. Unfortunately, in my center, we're seeing it. We're seeing a lot of strangulation. Strangulations are often part of sexual assaults. Strangulations can be used as autoerotica. Maybe it's part of a couple's routine. They strangle each other till they almost pass out. There is damage that can be done inside the neck during a strangulation that could be fatal, which means it can kill you. And you could never have a single bruise on the outside of the neck. You'll never see any marks. It's a myth to think that if somebody strangles you tight enough or severe enough to actually hurt the inside of your neck that surely you'd have bruises. No, you wouldn't. That's a myth. One of the things that we're able to offer at our center is a forensic strangulation assessment. So they're called non-fatal strangulation exams. And this is anybody, this is not domestic violence only. This is not sexual assault only. This is two guys who decide to get into it and start fighting and one decides to strangle the other. It's still a strangulation. So this is an exam that we offer at our center for anyone of any relationship, no matter how it happened. And it might not be something that law enforcement is involved in. Again, that's okay. But as a nurse, I'm extremely concerned medically for my victims who tell me that they had a strangulation encounter. And if it happens more than once, we see this over and over again. We see it in children who are in abusive situations at home. Their memory starts to get a little wonky. They're not doing as good in school. Their attention span starts to get a little crazy. You know, you used to be able to sit down in class all day long and now they're not turning in their homework. They can't sit still, they get antsy. Same thing happens as adults if they're being strangled because the brain over time, lack of oxygen takes its toll and they end up with a traumatic brain injury. We have patients who come to us and say, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I was strangled, but I do know that I was in the bathroom and we were arguing. And the next thing I remember is I was on the bathroom floor and the back of my neck really hurts. Like it's sort of like moved my neck. I know right there what happened. I know she was strangled in some capacity so tight and for so long that she lost consciousness. And it doesn't take long. It takes an average of 6.8 seconds to lose consciousness when you're being strangled. 6.8 seconds. After 14 seconds, you can lose control of your bladder, which means you pee on yourself. After 15 seconds average, you can lose control of your bowels. Around a minute, 62 seconds average, if the, if the pressure is consistent on that neck, then we start to see where they stop breathing. They will die. People have been strangled to death, to death. They have died and there's no bruises on the outside of the neck. There are some things that we can recommend to see if there's any damage inside the neck. And we would work with our hospitals to get those things done to make sure that that person's okay. But that's an, uh, that is a, a service that we would offer. So if you know of anybody, again, just kind of expanding it out, you know of anybody or you yourself, domestic violence, you've seen it, you've been there, you need help. If you're in it right now, let us help you get out. Sexual assaults, you've seen it, you've experienced it, if it's happened to you, let us help you. Strangulations in any of the, either of those cases, they're medical things that we are concerned about that we need to sit down. Let's just sit down and have a conversation. Let's at least just talk. We would love to help you. 
that's what I have for you this morning. Do we have any questions that have come up in any social media? If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, not yet. If you give us an extra 15 or 20 seconds for those sure. on the slight delay. Sure. Does anybody here have any questions or comments you'd like me to address? I will stick around for a while. I would like to go ahead and just reiterate our crisis line phone number. It's 912-538-9935. That's our crisis line number. And I would like to give you my personal work cell phone number. Sometimes people are a little hesitant to reach out and talk to somebody that they haven't seen or talked to before. So please let me give you my, my work cell phone number. It's area code 229-300-0955. You are welcome to call me. Let me give you my email too. It's S-A, as in sexual assault, S-A coordinator. V-I-D, as in Vidalia, V-I-D. So S-A coordinator, V-I-D at Gmail. Shoot me an email. Call me when it's convenient for you. If you have any questions, if there's anything that I can answer for you, anything you'd like to talk about, you need information about our resources and services that we provide, please reach out. I'd be happy to hook you up with, with whatever you need. Yes, which one? Your telephone number Telephone is 229 300 Email? Yes. S-A-Coordinator. V-I-D. At and the crisis line, 912-538-9935. Thank you. Yep. We appreciate Ms. Williams coming out um, with us today. For those of you um, that have been watching and you may want to reference this information again, or if you have any friends or people you know that want to view this information, we're going to post this up on the websites. We're going to post a recording on the Title IX website for East Georgia State College. That's required, a requirement that we have to make sure educational materials are there, but we will post this up for students and faculty and staff to watch later on if they want to view this information. And we'll put Ms. Williams' information there as well for you to contact her if you have any need of use of the refuge. Also, remind if you are a vic, if you or someone you know is a victim of sexual assault or any other um, area of sexual misconduct in our East Georgia State College Title IX policy, you can contact the Title IX office at title9ega.edu or two, uh, excuse me, um, um, 478-289-2015 is my office number. Um, we'll, we'll connect you with Title IX um, and we'll also connect you with the refuge if that needs to happen as well. So appreciate everybody coming out today. And with that, we'll end our workshop. And if you have any questions, please feel free to um, send those over to my email or to Ms. Williams. Thank you.